the cradle to the cross, Jesus embodied these Christmas words. This is our final look at those. Joy, uh, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the Father. You know, joy is the energizer of the soul. It's the Red Bull of the soul. It really is. And the reason I say that is because there is a premise of joy that, that has to be an inside work. It's an inside job. Um, the outside circumstances that you're in can produce a little laugh or it can produce sadness or tears or emotion. If you've watched uh, a few of the Hallmark Christmas movies, um, I simply cannot endure them anymore. I'm sorry. I simply cannot endure them. I could take a fifth grade class and write the same plot over and over and over. But here's why, here's why they're popular and here's why you enjoy them. There's not going to be any surprises and there's not going to be a heartache at the end. I just one time, though, wish that the girl would say, no, I don't want to marry you. I don't even like you. I just wish one time it would come. Joy is the energizer of the soul. Without joy in our heart, uh, we can't express the love uh, that we need to express, and it's difficult to have peace. And so from the cradle to the cross, th this has been a thing. And Jesus never spoke much about joy. He embodied it. You see, there's a lot of difference about talking about these words and just living them. And that's what Christ in us is. The, the stabilizer of our soul is next in peace. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Not the peace of this world, and Jesus made it very clear in the Gospel of Matthew, think not that I have come to bring peace to this world, but a sword, because the fight with the world is going on and on, and it will continue to go on. We've, you've not seen anything yet. So uh, if joy is the energizer, the red bull, or the, the bunny of uh, the, the soul, then truly peace is the stabilizer of the spirit. It's what keeps us calm in the midst of everyone else falling apart. And then love. Uh, love is the foundation of all relationships. So Jesus embodies these words. Now let's go back to verse 16, and you listen as Brother Jimmy read. And this, that was my fourth time this morning to read through John 3. And every time I saw a different facet of, of the work of Christ in us. John 3, 16, are you ready to say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Last week we talked about God's greatest attribute is his love. That he so loved the world. Hutas, the, the so, is, is not so much. It's not, oh, I just love you to death. It is in this manner he gave his life. This is love. The difference in speaking love and demonstrating love is, is an action of the will. We, we, when we say, and, and this, this past week doing a COVID wedding, uh, when a young man says to a young woman in, in the wedding ceremony, I love you, and she, she repeats, I love you, and they exchange rings, they have no idea at that point what all will be tested in the framing of those words. They, they have... Moving right on. <laughs> In the framing of those words, because when we say we love someone and we start on a journey, it has to be worked and demonstrated in such a way that the, the working of love itself becomes the words. And you say it less and less because it's demonstrated more and more. Amen, Bo? Amen. God's greatest attribute is his love. Young preachers are saying, no, it says demand for social justice. And uh, that's a very weak argument because everyone has been offended. Everyone has been hurt. Everyone has been harmed by some fa fashion or facet of this world. God's greatest attribute is his love. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In our state of sin, with a mind of sin, Christ died for us. So his greatest attribute is love. You know, um, Hank Williams Jr., it was his fourth or fifth wife that took him for everything that he owned. And his only public response to that was, 
Everything comes down to money or love. That may be the smartest thing that boy ever said. <laughs> Everything comes down to money or love. See, there's a sermon in every country song. Everything comes down to money or love. For God so loved the world. It is difficult for us to examine ourselves by ourselves, and that's what we keep. We're kind of like Congress and Senate, and if we investigate ourselves and find ourselves well. But when God looks at your love, but when God looks at and examines your heart, what does he see there that demonstrates love? For greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus said to his disciples one day over by John 14, he said, I, I, I call you no longer disciple. I call you my friends. Why? Because they had moved from this relationship into a different relationship. So God's greatest attribute is love. God's uh, greatest gift is Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're still reviewing from last week. Gifts. This was the gift week, wasn't it? Uh, my wife is not with us this morning, and uh, she's not sick. She's fine. But uh, a little bit of family got to come in, and so spending just a little time with them uh, because we didn't get to through the holiday. But um, so she's doing that. I can't outgive her. I try and I try, but I cannot outgive her um, because she thinks about it. She studies what would be. And she, by December the 26th, she's already thinking about next year, what this gift should be. Folks, that's a lot of pressure. Because, I mean, I was, I was out on December the 23rd. I was looking everywhere, trying to come up with something. She, the entire year, she's thinking of the gift. And, you know, it's the same with, with, with Jesus Christ. His love is unconditional. He loved us in that while we were yet sinners, he loves us in our sin. His love is unbelievable. The songwriter and singer Toby Mack, most of you don't know him because you don't listen to a lot of contemporary, but man, he wrote a good line. I have given God a million reasons not to love me, but none of them changed his mind. When I consider the work of thy hands, the psalmist said, when I consider all of this, what is man that thou art mindful of him, that you have stopped and loved mankind? So his greatest gift is Jesus. One day online, just in one day online, $9 billion America spent. Billion with a B. This Christmas season, America spent $465 billion. Folks, that's a lot of cash. It's a lot of money. That's all trying in a gift sense to give. Every true gift is unconditional. It's unconditional. It was given from a heart of love. You can't take it back. Every true gift is unconditional. And you know, uh, I love what uh, Matthew said, what Jesus said in Matthew. He said, you know, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more does your heavenly Father, how much more does your heavenly Father who is in heaven, give to you who ask him. He gives good gifts. Every year when we're opening our gifts, my, one of my son-in-laws says, right before you get it open, if it's from him, he, he'll remind you, that ain't the cheap kind. <laughs> right before I get it open, that ain't the cheap kind. Life is a gift. All life is a gift. All preborn life is a gift. We are in a fight of our lives, ladies and gentlemen, literally the fight of our lives. I pray that, and I know all of you are wanting 2021 to get here, but you may ought to throw out an anchor and slow up a little bit because I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. You're setting yourselves up for a fall because the battle has not yet even begun. For our own, our own delegation from Arkansas has totally betrayed this state. We've been betrayed by all of our politicians. We've been betrayed 
by those who sit in places of authority thinking that they can make decisions without a will of the people or that they are not held accountable. You say, you shouldn't be political. They shouldn't be stupid. They should not be arrogant. They should be servants of people. They should be servants of people. I kid with all of you. And he said, I don't, you know, I had a, I was up in, I don't remember. I think it was Ohio and a lady came to me after, by the second, end of the second service. And she said, I, I do not appreciate your, your preaching. I do not appreciate your singing. Uh, why do you need to be funny? I have never found anything funny in church. I said, ma'am, I, I, I believe that. I believe that. <laughs> I believe that because this is home. This is, we, we're going to laugh together and we're going to cry together. We're going to love one another and we're going to tell each other the truth. This is home. You may be a little more holy than me if, if nothing's funny. But the greatest gift God gave to us was Jesus Christ. And boy, you can't outgive that. You just can't do it. So when I see a Christmas season come, as it comes and goes as they do, and uh, by 1047 Christmas morning, our tree was down and stored. All decorations were down and stored. And I, by 11 o'clock, I was drinking McDonald's coffee, all done, put away, done. <laughs> Listen, one principle I've learned is when the party's over, folks, take it down. And so uh, since we didn't have any, any uh, next day stuff, I did that. But Christmas, we put it back in the box, we put it in the closet, and ready till next time. But the gift of Jesus Christ uh, is unconditional, given to us by God. And now we get into uh, God's greatest promise. God's greatest promise is everlasting life. For God so loved the world, God's greatest attribute is love. That he gave his only begotten son, that's the greatest gift, that's Jesus that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's greatest promise is eternal life. God's greatest promise is the whosoever believes. And inside of that, there's a, there's a lot we want to see. And I asked Brother Jimmy to read the entire chapter, even though we won't get past verse 16. It's still good for us to, to, to hear the weight of the word on a Sunday morning, all of it. Uh, there are Maybe three little lessons inside of this God's greatest promise. And a promise is a promise. I hate to make promises because if you make a promise, you are bound by that. If your word means anything, you are bound by that. If your word that comes from your mouth cannot be trusted by your own family or, or by your own friends, by your own church, in, in your business, your work. If your word cannot be trusted, then you cannot make a promise. And, and you absolutely lose weight and value as a human being. Your promises are promises. Don't break them or don't make them. When we make a promise, keep it. That's the, that's the empowering that God gives to us. And his greatest promise, he's promised us many, many things. We're going to have a home in heaven. We're not going to have to be on diets in heaven. There'll be no issues in heaven. There'll be no cancer in heaven. For the former things are passed away, he says in Revelation. For the former things have been passed away. Neither is there any more tears. Neither is there any more crying. It's all gone. We heard a lot this last couple of weeks about the Bethlehem star. Some people say, that, no, this is a da-da-da. When, when Jupiter lines with Saturn, the two brightest lights of our, of our um, solar system, we'll have the Bethlehem star. And I was asked probably about 20 different times on messaging what I thought about this. Here's what I know. If you see anything in this universe and you look up and you see it, God put it there. Yeah. Except the AT&T satellites. <laughs> if you see a star, a galaxy, the sun, the moon, you can bet on one thing. God put it there. In Revelation 4, 11, O Lord, our Lord, you are worthy to receive three things. Glory honor, and power, because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Even in John 1, uh, just one or two chapters over, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning. All things were made, verse 3, 
All things were made. Verse 3. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. What does that mean? It means if you look up and you see it, God put it there. Don't attribute to the devil what God's work has done. So when, whatever you're talking about, and, and this leads us into this question because uh, Jesus said, Marvel not that I said to you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus appears three times, only in the Gospel of John. The first is here in John 3 with the hows. Every, every answer Jesus gives is followed by how. He's a smart man. He appears again in chapter 7 where he addresses the Sanhedrin and he says to the Sanhedrin, wait a minute, you, you can't bring these charges about Jesus until he has first been through a trial. You can't pronounce him guilty until he's had this hearing. And then he comes up again at the, the cross, at the death of Jesus Christ. Here he comes and he partners with Joseph of Arimathea and and he provides the burial stuff that is needed. So he's mentioned only three times. First principle, Jesus must be learned. How can this happen, Jesus? For a disciple, you've got to learn Jesus. Now, it's not going to be on the screen because this is new. Um, you've got to learn. Jesus must be learned. Marvel not that I said to you, you must be born again. How many of us have not heard that over and over and over and went through the struggle in our own mind, being born again. And maybe some of you in this room, this very moment, are struggling with this fact, you must be born again. It is not you must be religious. It is not you must be good. It is not that you must be righteous. It is that you must be born again. And so the, the, the question of the ages from the Sanhedrin, the chief of the Sanhedrin, the smartest one in the group is, how? And Jesus said, well, there are two births. See, Jesus has to be learned. There are two births. He says to Nicodemus, for you see, there is a physical birth. You must be born of water. There's a spiritual birth in which you must be born by the Spirit. And that's how. There are two births. Jesus answered, verse 5, Most assuredly I say, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So there are two distinct births here. Now, you would think, okay, this answers the question, but it doesn't. And it doesn't for us because we still have to, to put this, this matter to rest of, but how can I be born again? I get it. I, I get the, the water, the, the birth sack. I get that. The water breaks. The baby is born. I get that. It's a physical birth. I can see that one. And you see, that's the question that's not being asked. Nicodemus says, I get that. We see a baby be born. There's a physical birth. But a spiritual birth, we cannot see it. Oh, and Jesus says, well, look, listen, Nick, that's a great idea. He said, but a believer is just like the wind. It blows where it wants to blow. Now, he's not saying believers are like the wind, although some of them are. <laughs> they just kind of blow. He's not saying that, that believers just blow around to the left and the right and the north and south and don't have a place. He's not talking about that at all. What he's saying is, um, listen, the wind, verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound, but you can't tell where it's going. Why? Because it's a, it is an unseen fact. Woe be to the person who's teaching our boys and girls to only believe what they can see. Because that is a false science. Many things that cannot be seen. And so the, a believer is, is like the wind. You hear the sound, but you can't tell where it's coming or where it's going. So is everyone that is born in the Spirit. You're not identified by where you're standing. You're not identified by uh, your look as a believer. You're identified how? By the word of your testimony, by the works of your hands, you're identified. So Jesus has to be learned, even though he comes to us in an act, in, the, in a moment. It, you can come this morning or you can sit right there and you can say, I confess Jesus Christ. And he comes into your heart in a nanosecond, but it will take the rest of your life to become like Jesus Christ. And you probably won't get it done even by the end. It's going to take the rest of your life. So while it takes but a moment to confess Christ, it takes your entire life to, to learn Christ. 
and to become the learned one of Christ. So how am I identified? Jesus said, look, believers are like the wind. They're moving, but you can't tell where from and where going. But it's not a condition by which they can see it. And that's what is driving Nick crazy. So that's not the only question. It's not just a how. How can I be born again? He said, well, you must be born again. How can I be born again? Well, you must uh, understand that there are two births. There's a physical birth we all identify with. There's a spiritual birth. I know, but how can these things be? And that's the second principle. It's not only that Christ must be learned. Christ must be listened to. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to have to listen to his word. There, there, is a, there is a rebellion, uh, not just in America, but in, in mankind. There's a rebellion. It's not started just because of the last eight years or whatever. There's a rebellion in the heart of every one of us that says, I, I do what I want to do. Yeah. Um, I love children, always love children, work with children for 45 years. Uh, I've, I've done so many crazy things with children to get more children, to gain more children. I've, I've had uh, children in our homes uh, that, that were abused, uh, that would not even make eye contact with you because of the physical abuse or even sexual abuse in, in the child. And so w when you look at the, the child and you see the heart of a child, how that they're so trusting but see, there is a rebellion that says, uh, you know, I can treat a child a certain way. For instance, the state of, state of California recently enacted a law and the governor signed it that I can treat a child any way I want to sexually as long as the age, the age is only within 10 years of mine and, that, and, the, and the child. I'm going to tell you something now. I'm fully aware this is being recorded. There are states that have become satanic. Satanic in their thought processes that says, like there's crazy Macy over there with Preslow. Both of those girls have run up to me and give me a big hug this morning. And uh, listen to me. And I know the new etiquette is preachers don't hug anyone keep children back. I'm going to tell you how we're going to do it here. As long as boys and girls run up and hug me, we're going to hug. We're going to do that. You know why? Because children, children need the embrace. Could you imagine what it would be as, I'm sorry, you can't be within three feet of me, you know? Why is that? Because we're allowing a satanic mind in the world. And I'm not saying just it's California is satanic. I'm saying their leaders are. Many of their leaders are satanic to pass such laws that could, but why, why is this a rebellion? A rebellion of the heart. You may be just as rebellious today. I know I certainly was. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. A man in church one day got up during invitation, stormed out. I didn't catch it at all, but someone said, you need to go see so-and-so because he stormed out. What's his problem? He said, no one is going to tell him. He has to bow his head. No one's going to tell him he has to pray. That's just rebellion. I don't blame him anymore. I don't blame anybody else. That's what rebellion is. But there will come a day where that knee will bend and the head will bow. See, the, the, we, are, we are so compromised in our thinking in churches today that we're being warned, do not offend people. Do not offend people. Do not offend people. And I don't want to offend anyone. But I am telling you, uh, with, with the Holy Spirit as my witness, this thing right here, it's offensive. <laughs> it is offensive. And the more I rebel about it, the more I rebel in it, the more that my heart says, I will do what I want. No one can tell me what I want uh, to do or what I will do. Then it, it becomes offensive. So it's not just that Jesus must be learned because Nicodemus is still asking the, the, the question, but how can I do this? I'm an old man. How can I be born again? Well, not a physical birth, Nick, a spiritual birth. To enter into the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to surrender your will. Now, um, when I consider uh, these verses and I think about the learning of Jesus, it's, it's also the listening to. Notice what he says, um, verse 9. 
Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. You've got to be listened to. Jesus got to be listened to. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, he said, Listen, I speak that which I know. And I testify to that which I've seen. Now, don't let this get past you. If you yellow underline in the Bible, this is the spot. If you asterisk, or st- this is the spot. Why? Because as a believer, we should only speak of that which we know. And we should only testify of that which we have seen. And that narrows that. See, the offense is coming today because sometimes, and I just did it. I stepped over a line already twice this morning on things I should or should not say. I recognize that. And I recognize that sometimes there's a price to pay for it. Uh, when our current governor turned his head the other way and said medical marijuana is a, yeah, it'd be a good thing. Well, it has been so far. Uh, $200 million so far and it hadn't really gotten off the ground. It's a great thing for the state. It's the same. He kind of turned the other way because, you know, we need to be like Colorado. We, we need to be like these states uh, that have all these things going. And so... I, I had a tirade on TV, and I said, vote against proposition so-and-so. Next thing I know, I'm being sued. Next thing I know, I've got 86,000 bad complaints on Facebook. Uh, and I understand there's a price to pay. Five different lawyers were there trying to fend for me. One of them said, why do you have to open your mouth on everything that comes down the pike? Because everything that comes down the pike filters into this church. And that's, so all, all the SBC leadership today said, you guys, you know, you need, to, you need to settle down. Let this election take its own natural course. After all, this will all work out, da, da, da. Uh, and really, our, the, the, the people in the pews don't really want to know this stuff. I said, what land are you people living in? Where is your brain? Of course, they know this not only want to know, uh, it's not just a matter of feeling disenfranchised. It's a matter of what direction is this nation going and where do we find ourselves and, and, and what will the church in its influence be in another five years if we continue on this same track? So, yes, we get involved. Yes, I understand there's a price to pay. Yes, I know that there are certain things that become offensive. I do not mean for them to be. But I do know that the truth of the word uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 4 says it cuts even to the joints and the marrow. If C.O. Jake running around, he's got a finger in a, in a big tab. He found out about knives and how sharp they are. See, but the word of God is even sharper than Jake's knife. It will pierce even to the dividing asunder of the joint and the marrow, you know where the marrow is, right? Inside the bone. And is even a discerner of the intent of the heart. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So while, yes, this, this can be offensive, you have to understand that the Word of God cuts us. It really does. And Nicodemus, you're standing here. You've asked, how can I be born again? Now, it never tells us if he is born again. But if you're going to know Christ, you've got to learn Christ. You have to learn him, and you have to listen to him. We speak what we know. We testify to that which we have seen. <laughs> next, next question is, how in the world can this be? He's got to be listened to. The last thing about Jesus is, um, Nicodemus asked once more, well, how, how can this be? And Jesus said, listen, even as Moses, because you study the law, right, Nicodemus, you study the law, Old Testament, everything's Old Testament, just as Moses lifted up the serpent. And you know the story. They'd reached the, the, the point, and there were serpents everywhere. People were being bitten by the snakes, and they, they took the serpent and lifted it up on the pole to take the sting of the adder. So too, he says, and he said, now listen to me, so too was Jesus lifted up that he would take the sting of your sin and allow you to be healed in the process. Now, there's not much more frightening thing than a snake that's about to bite. It's just a frightening thing. Most of, it, most of us, it's a frightening thing to see a snake. Green garter, doesn't matter. It just doesn't, it's just a snake and it needs to die. But 
But he said, just as the Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up to take the sting of sin away. Jesus must be lifted up. Do you hear? It's not just enough for that we learn Jesus, we learn these principles. It's not enough that we listen to him. Jesus must be lifted up. He must be lifted up. Do you hear what I'm saying? Every part of your life, you have to lift up Jesus higher than you lift yourself. This is the same chapter by which, Jesus, uh, by which John says, you know what? He must increase that I must decrease. You, you can't be full of Jesus and full of yourself at the same time. It's impossible. There's a, there is a word um, for emptying, to, to take from ourselves all that we are, empty ourselves so that we can be filled with Jesus Christ. Now, one last verse. As we look in uh, John, verse 12. If, you, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You cannot lift up Jesus while you're lifting yourself. You cannot lift up Jesus while you're lifting up your favorite doctrine. You can't lift up Jesus if you're lifting up your church. You can't lift up Jesus if you're lifting up your family. You can't lift up Jesus if you're lifting up a, a certain philosophy. You can only lift up Jesus when you lift up Jesus. So every conversation we have, is Jesus edified by this thing or not? Every thought that I have, it says that every thought is, is to be uh, safeguarded and a firewall built in it so that it brings nothing but glory to God. Now, I wish that mine worked all the time because it doesn't. I would love to tell you that, no, I've got a firewall around my soul, my heart, my mind, and it's all perfect. God has it. But, but you know better than that. And when he says here, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. That's our job, folks, is to lift up Jesus Christ. Now, that sounds easy, doesn't it? Let's just lift up Jesus. Um, let's just lift up Jesus. Let's just lift up Jesus. Let's pick Jesus up higher than we are. To pick up anything higher than, than you are means that every part of you has to be brought down. The book of Philippians contains seven steps that Jesus went down. And he lowered himself and became and became and became. And then it's followed by seven steps up. So that at the, at the end of that progress, it says that at the name of Jesus, no other name. He's, he's elevated to this portion. So every day when you get up, You've you got to think when you get up, first off, Lord, I thank you. You've given me this day because this belongs to him. It's not yours. It's not mine. I'm going to start off, Lord, by thanking you for this day. Second, I'm going to I'm going to pray that I will be lifting you up all day. You see, that's what praise is. And joy, again, is the, that's the red bull of the soul by which we, we get. And when we, when we praise him, if you do it in song, if you do it in life, my greatest praise moments are usually when no one else was in, within a mile of me. And it's just a realization of how good the Lord is. And like the Bethlehem star, okay, if it hasn't been here in 1800 years and you see the star that you normally see, or you see the star that's always there, or is it the North Star, or is it really Jupiter and Saturn? It's just a line every 779 years. Da -da. Who cares? Who cares? I look up and I see the star. What is, what is man that you're mindful of me today? You got to get yourself in that because you can't lift up Jesus if you're still mad about yesterday. One of the things I hate the most about Christmas is opening presents. Not mine, but, but the whole concept. Uh, and, and we give gifts to one another. And we've done it all. Let's don't get anybody anything. Then we went to the list. Let's make everybody a homemade thing by hand. That was kind of a disappointing year. Some of my family are very not good at this. Yeah. I worked for three months on mine. And then we go to the Dirty Santa thing, which is... Uh, that's just a good way to have a family fight. That's all that is. But there's the opening of the gifts. And then we went through the stage where before you open, we're, we're all going to watch little Johnny open his gift. And there's 19 of us sitting there waiting, little Johnny. And then there's one in the family who wants to keep every bow and reuse the scotch tape. 
and fold the paper flat and keep it for next year. So we have every present has that. There's all that going on. But the thing that breaks my heart about all of us is the ingratitude of the soul. I don't need a present. I don't need a present. I don't need anything. I just wish that my heart could sometimes hook up to that 220. I mean, a direct 220 line, Jace. Boom, give me a jolt of Jesus. One that reminds me of my job today was to lift up Jesus. That was my only job, lifting him up. But I lifted myself higher than I lifted him. I lifted my family higher than I lifted him. I lifted my, my, my thoughts higher than him. So there it is. The words of Christmas. Who for the joy set before him. Therefore having peace with God we have love. For God so loved the world. So we won't talk about it anymore for a while. But what a concept to walk away with that the cross means to us. We confess Jesus Christ. And we live in an environment that picks at us anyway. I mean, the world doesn't get that. It's Nicodemus all over again. How, how, how? How can you go around saying that you have this inside when we can't see it? And I actually get that as a question of the world. They can't see it. So we got to demonstrate it a little bit more. we got to work on that demonstration about joy, peace, and love in our hearts. Christmas week. It's over. Now we're ready for for the new year. I wish I could tell you COVID will be out and mask will be a thing of the past, but y'all know better, right? I mean, you understand where we're headed. Uh, there is such a huge danger in, in our country of compliance uh, with everything. I noticed a CDC report that I, I've been asked, why is there no flu? Well, CDC explained that to us. I said, well, there's no flu this year because people are wearing masks and social distancing. Hmm. Why is there COVID? Because people aren't wearing masks and they're not social distancing. I mean, folks, I'm telling you, you better look to Jesus this year. I, I pray... And it, I pray that you're not going to make a whole bunch of New Year's resolutions, but maybe one could be, I'm going to lift up Jesus if he kills me. I'm going to find a way in this school to lift up Jesus uh, by my actions, my attitude, my heart toward others. I'm going to find a way at this job. I'm going to find a way at the bank. I'm going to find a way at this. I'm going to lift up Jesus if it kills me and everybody else around me. You know, lift up Jesus. The most secure person in the world is a baby being held by a mom and daddy not about to drop it I was out on a wilderness uh, adventure once a bunch of preteens one of them twisted ankle very bad we duct taped her up she couldn't walk anymore we got to a fast running stream and we had to use a line to get across it we were holding on to one another And so I said, give her to me. And she, she's 11, 12 years old. And I'm walking on rocks. And I said to her before we started, I said, do you trust me? She said, kind of. <laughs> I said, you hold on to me. I'll get you to the other side. I'll get you there. Because I knew at the end of this thing, I had to give her to a mama and a daddy that expected me to get her there. I said the very same thing in John 17, all that the Father has given to me, I still got you in my hand. I pray that you lift up Jesus this year. Let's stand together with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. I talked with the pastor this week at Sugarloaf. He's such a great guy, Brother Tony, his sweet wife, Miss Tootie. Good people, good church. You know, COVID hit them hard this week. I pray that you'll pray for them. But that's the way these storms are going to come. They're just going to keep coming. They're just going to keep hitting folks. I've heard of two 
funerals coming up this week from y'all about friends and family that's lost to this dreaded thing. I don't know anything else to do but to keep lifting up Jesus, though. What's going to hit this church, Brother Bob? I wish I could tell you. I wish I could tell you of the winds of destruction that want to blow over us. All I can tell you is these steel girders, four on each side, eight, eight across the top that hold this thing together are not really what holds this church together. So when this storm hits and there's more stuff coming, I pray that we would be the church that doesn't run to the Frady hole, but that stands strong in the storm, lifting up Jesus all the way. That's our only job, folks, just to lift up Jesus. I don't know if Nicodemus walked away that day happy or sad. I wish, I wish we knew. He doesn't appear again till chapter 7, and there he defends Jesus. Then he, then he appears one last time at the, at the cross. Maybe he got it. But whether he did or whether he didn't, do you get it? Do you get it? I sometimes wish I could be saved again just to go through that experience and remember what it's like to have the weight lifted off, to remember what it's like to, ex to experience true forgiveness, to remember what it's like to, to let things go. The harm and the wrong that you've been done. But I can't be saved again because I'm still in his hand. I never jumped out. I can't jump out. I'm in his hand. So I don't need that experience even though what David said, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I think a lot of us may need that. So as we enter in the the last of a year, there's something in our spirit that says we've got to change something. We've got we to get on a diet. We've got to do some changing. Let's just change this one thing. Let's just try to lift up Jesus higher than we ever lifted him up. Let's stop trying to care who gets credit for what. And we see a brother or sister or a whole church that goes down and struggles. Or the, our first response is, how in the world can we help you? How in the world can we help you? Because that is how the world sees this Jesus in us. Hmm. So, Father, here we stand before you. We're here to learn you. I pray that you'll help us to want to listen to you. And I pray we can lift you up. Lord, I don't think I've ever been around a better bunch of folks in my life that want to laugh and love that want to help and they open their pocketbooks they open their hearts so I pray that when we examine ourselves here this just short moment that we can ask ourselves our motives are good our hearts are good but are we really lifting Jesus up Father, may we not lift this church up. May we not lift our ministers up. May we not lift our music up. Just lift you up. Give us a heart that wants to lift you up. Lord, for the little children in Afghanistan that have Bibles this morning because of this church, how we thank you. For the 13 boys and girls in Kenya that this past week, through a wire of money, finally got a little gift to help in their poverty from this church we thank you Lord from Carlos and Carmen who have started and planted another new church in Monterey out where no one in the world thought this would work but because of the gift of this church they're open right now they may never ever see this place never ever see the big red barn but may they lift up Jesus in all that they do Lord, you're good, and you're good all the time. How we thank you and praise your holy name. Our heads are bowed, our hearts are bowed before the Lord. As we do every week, if, you, if this is the day you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, then you need to walk down here and tell our fine preacher, listen, I, I just prayed to receive Jesus Christ.
to our boys and girls who are in the room with us today. If you haven't prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart, then you need to confess that to him right where you are. Tell your mom or your dad, Nana, Papa, I just asked Jesus into my heart. If you're here this morning and you say, you know, I've lifted up everything in the world but Jesus this week, this is a time for you to confess. Don't even have to come to an altar. Just confess standing before him right now. Lord, I didn't lift you up this week. I lifted up everything in the world but you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Your greatest gift, God, is Jesus. And I didn't lift him up. I didn't lift him up. This morning you say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm going through, I'm going through some stuff. I'm not going to ask you to come to this altar. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'll see you and I'll recognize you. I'll be your prayer partner. I'm going through some stuff. And I'm finding it hard to lift up anything but sadness and tears and a little bit of bitterness and even some hatred. It's, it's what's being elevated. Pray for me because I don't want it to be this way. I need that prayer. If you'll just lift your hand up quickly and put it back down, I'll be praying for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Father, may we lift you up. May we be encouraged by those who lift you up. We see a great need, dear Lord, for for churches to get honest now. Lord, the battle winds are about to blow. The trumpets are going to sound. And the battle cry is going to be onward, forward. I pray that we can lift you up. This morning, I'll quit talking now. You need to come to this altar. You come. If this is the day that you say, I want to become a member of the church, then, then you come. And we'll pray with you and share you how with you do that. This is the day you say, I, want, I need to be baptized. And we'll share with you how to follow through on that. We'll quietly stand for a moment more. But if you need to come to this altar, then you do so right now. Slip out from where you are. There's always an openness here for that. You need to do business with the Lord. Then you come. So. Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for.
Father, we thank you for a beautiful time together. We pray that you'll use this time. We thank you for our hearts that are warm towards you. We pray that we'll go out and lift you up higher than we've ever lifted you up. Regardless of what happens in our nation and the, the politics of the mind and the deceptions of the heart and uh, the wickedness of soul, we thank you that you are pure and that we can lift you up. We thank you that you are the truth for our lives. So, Father, we have above all things, I pray that we'll walk out of here loving one another more than we loved each other when we walked in. And then we'll take a firm hold on what you want to do in our lives and we'll be strong. Father, if becoming a Christian is going to be uh, unpopular in 2021, I pray that we'll be uh, standing tall for you. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. We have a guest with us today. Want to? We usually don't call guests out, but it is so good to have uh, this particular guest back with us. Down from Michigan, if you look over there, would you introduce your guest with us, Miss Susan? My mama's home. <laughs> All right. It's it is so good to see.